we are going to continue in our sermon series. We have been in the Sermon on the Mount for the last several weeks. Um, last week, we had Derek Carrier uh, and our youth Sunday, and he was uh, going through a few of the chapters there, talking about prayer, fasting, giving. Uh, he did a wonderful job, and, and we're kind of playing off that this week. It's continuing. This morning, we're going to be talking about treasure. Um, we're going to be talking about treasure, and where our treasure is, that's where our heart is. Uh, and so we're going to talk just a little bit about that this morning. But as kind of an introduction, I want to read a story. Um, it's actually the story of the origins of a song that some of us may know. Um, and uh, maybe you've heard this before, but I think it's really appropriate, um, really appropriate for our message this morning. Uh, and a gentleman named Horatio uh, Spatford was a successful lawyer and a businessman in Chicago with a lovely family, a wife, Anna, and five children. That sounds familiar, right? Uh, however, they were not strangers to tears and tragedies. Their son died of pneumonia in 1871, and in that same year, the business, uh, the business was lost in the great Chicago fire. Yet God had his mercy and kindness and allowed the business to flourish once more. On November 21st, 1873, uh, the French open line, ocean liner that was crossing the Atlantic from the U.S. to Europe with 313 passengers on board, among were the family, uh, his wife, and four daughters. Uh, although Mr. Spafford had planned to go with the family, he found it necessary to stay in Chicago to so uh, solve an unresolved business problem. He told his wife that he would join her and the children in Europe, and a few days later, his plans, uh, he planned to take another ship. About four days into the crossing the Atlantic, the ship collided with powerful with an iron-hulled Scottish ship. Suddenly, all of uh, those who were on board were in grave danger. Um, ultimately, what happened is, uh, over 12 minutes, uh, the, sh the ship sank into the dark waters uh, and carried with it 226 passengers including the four children. Uh, a sailor rowing a boat over the spot where the ship had gone down spotted a woman floating on the wreckage. It was Anna, his wife. She was still alive. Pulled her in and picked her up uh, onto another vessel. Nine days later, she landed in Wales. Uh, there she wired her husband the message, saved alone. What shall I do? Mr. Fa Spafford later uh, 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 framed in a telegram that he placed in his office. Um, it said, God gave me four daughters, uh, and now I've been they've been taken from me. Someday I will understand why. Mr. Spafford booked passage on the next available shift and left to join his grieving wife. With the ship about four days out, the captain called for Spafford to his cabin and told him, this spot was where his, the, the, it had gone down and then where his, he had lost his children. According to Bertha Spafford Vester, the daughter born after the tragedy, Spafford wrote, it is well with my soul while on that journey. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. You can just imagine the, the kind of grief that this man was going through. He was going through the grief of loss in a way that many of us don't understand or don't know. The loss of a child. Not only that, but uh, business troubles and then additional loss throughout his life. It was a difficult life. But there was something different about this man. His heart was not set in this world, but his heart was dedicated and heart set in heaven with his Savior, Christ Jesus. And this morning, we're going to talk just a little bit about that. We're going to talk about this morning having our treasure in heaven and our hearts with Jesus. Our heart should be in heaven and our treasure should be Jesus. And so this morning, we're going to be talking about that. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be starting in verse 19, and we're only going to verse 24. So we're going to take some time and dive into these verses just a little bit. But let's pray and prepare our hearts before we continue. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to open up your word. We pray that we would be changed by it, that your Holy Spirit would speak through it, Lord, that we would understand this idea of having heavenly perspective, eternal perspective, having our hearts in heaven and our treasure be Jesus. Lord, I pray that we would be a church that would be like that, that we would individually be like that, that we would understand 
why that is important, that we would not place our faith and our hope and our trust in this world. Lord, even though you have things, good things like family and, and careers and, and, and things of this world that, that can be good and they can be beneficial and filling to us, Lord, help us not to rest in those things, but help us to rest in you and you alone. Help us to know that that is how we um, can be content, that that's how we can be fulfilled. If we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all of it shall be added on to us. So help us this morning to do that. I pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning and help us understand. We thank you for that. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Starting in verse 19, it says, Do not lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where moth or rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if the eye is healthy, then the whole body will be full of light. But if the eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will devote himself to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So this morning, we're diving deep here into these few verses, and, and this is Jesus is continuing the Sermon on the Mount. And just a reminder, we're, we're looking at an audience here where Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Now, there's a great crowd there, and people have began to follow after Jesus. Uh, they began to see uh, his great messages. They began to see his miracles. There have been rumors that this might be the Messiah. And, and so there's a, a gathering of people. He had called his disciples to follow after him. And so he's teaching them. And so there's this kind of understanding that this is a believing context. This is not Jesus speaking necessarily to an unbelieving crowd, although it was likely that there were some that were not genuine believers in the crowd or maybe were seeking but this message here is for those who were following Jesus. And what he's trying to do is help them understand the upside down nature of the kingdom of heaven. That it is very opposite from the kingdom of the world. That the things and the priorities that we have in this world oftentimes are the opposite. And can, sometimes the teachings of the kingdom of heaven can almost seem counterintuitive. And this is definitely one of those weeks where he's trying to help them understand how to live a life of contentment. How to live a life Life that deals with the challenges of the world and helps us have a heavenly perspective. So he begins by saying, in verse 19 once again, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. So first, let's just talk just a second here, uh, where your treasure is, okay? So the treasure that they're talking about, he's talking about uh, um, building up treasure. The, kind of the idea of treasure would be something that we desire most. Uh, the thing that we put the most value in would be our treasure. Jesus actually uses a, par a couple parables uh, later on in Matthew. Matthew records this uh, in Matthew 13, 44 through 46. Uh, and actually we see the parable of the hidden treasure, but also a parable of the great pearl. Um, and so if you want to mark that, I'm just going to read them quick for us. It says, And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over what he goes and sells, all that he has to buy that field. So a man found a great treasure, buried it, bought the field, sold all that he has for this single treasure. And it says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who when he found the one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Once again, we have a pearl merchant who, who knows pearls and there's this prized pearl, the one that is most valuable. And he says that he would cast away everything else, sell everything else just to have that one. So that idea of treasure, we all have a treasure in our hearts. What are the things that we treasure most? What are those things that we place in most highest value that we seek after that we would figuratively and maybe even literally sell all that we have if we have this one thing. What do we sell everything for? What do we sell everything for? And sometimes this can happen in money. Certainly there's a way that, that money can be something that people seek after and, and they will sell everything, their family, their, their relationships, everything to seek after monetary wealth. How about relationships? Certain relationships, we, we want to seek fulfillment through relationships that we have. 
And we are willing to put up, cast aside everything else in order to get that relationship that we think is going to fulfill us. That may or may not include sex. Or how about possessions? How about stuff? How about the things that we, we want to purchase? How many of you, when you walk past, what's, the, what's your store? I don't know what it is, but it's kind of worn off. But in my younger years, it used to be Best Buy. All right, for me, it used to be Best Buy. I think since Amazon is there and you can just about buy anything from Amazon, like a lot cheaper from you know, some foreign land or something like that, it was so hard for me to go to Best Buy because there were so many, I, there was stuff there I didn't even know I wanted yet. And then I'd want it, right? Okay, so stuff. But the funny thing is, how many of you have experienced this? You, 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 there's that one thing that you want and you're thinking, man, if I just get this, I've done all the research and I know that finally after I get this thing, I'll be happy. And then you go ahead and get it. And what happens like a day later? Like, it's old stuff now, right? And so we, we oftentimes go around a circle of just going to get more and more stuff, and we, and we sell the stuff that we used to have to, that didn't make us happy, so we can just buy more stuff that won't continue to make us happy, right? Sometimes we treasure stuff. How about any of you treasure being right? All right, winning the argument, having a one-up on somebody, I'm going to just say this is all of ours, this next one. How about self? How many of us treasure self above all? Self. See, what we see here is, is oftentimes we do sell all things for things that we treasure. But we see Jesus tells us another parable in the foolish rich man. It's in Luke 12, 16 through 21. It says, he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man had produced plentiful. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? <clears throat> For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and I will build larger ones. And there I will store up all the grains and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you are, have ample goods laid up for you for many years. Relax, drink, and be, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the thing you have prepared, those will, whose will they be? So it is with one who lays up treasures for himself and not rich towards God. So we see that we have a man that would, uh, he, he stored up, uh, he had plenty. And so all he was concerned about is getting more and more and more. And that's what happens with money and, and things and possessions is we always want more. Kind of the, the standard, how much money is enough? Most people's answer is just a little bit more just a little bit more, and it doesn't matter where their income is at, it's always just a little bit more. See, what greed actually is, is, is greed is the um, uh, logical result to believing there is no life after death, and that we should grab what we can while we can, uh, so that we can, and we can hold on to it as tight as possible. That was Sir Fred uh, Cathwood uh, said that in an article about greed. And so what is our treasure? What is our treasure? Oftentimes what we will treasure are things of this world, but here's what Jesus says in verse 20, but lay up for yourself treasure in heaven where neither noth, moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. So we see actually a parallel passage in Luke 12, 32 through 33. It says, fear not little flock for your father's good pleasure is to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourself with money bags that do not grow old, with treasure in heaven that does not fail, and where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. So a, a treasure that doesn't fade. The challenge that we find is, is oftentimes when we try to build up treasure in this world, it fades. It loses its glimmer. It doesn't last. We famously had a, uh, a woman at our old church. Uh, she was a, a good friend of ours and, and I used to be in the, we used to have a drama ministry. Anybody remember in like the early 2000s when church used to have drama ministries? Yeah, and they would do skits and things like that. Okay, I was on that. And this woman was like the director of that. And I don't know if she, I, I think she liked me, but I don't think she liked all my ideas because I had a lot of ideas. I had a lot of, I, and she would just, the sweetest way, tell me, yeah, no, we're not going to do that, right? So she would, she would just kind of put me back in my place. But one of the sayings that she used to have, we, used, we were actually going through a building program in our old church where we, we were a mobile church like we are here, and we were going to uh, uh, 
a fundraising process and we were building a church and the church actually went through that and she had this phrase that she always reminded us whenever we were going through struggles, whenever we were trying to make decisions on how we wanted things to be, she would always tell us, it's all going to burn anyway. It's all going to burn anyway. It's all temporary. Even a church building, even the things that we think are so important are going to, in the end, be gone. We can't take it uh, with us. And, and, and one of the favorite puns that I have, when we were children's directors back at our old uh, church, if, if you know me, you know I, I like a good pun, okay? So we uh, did gifts for, it's kind of appropriate, last week we did gifts for our children's volunteers and our youth volunteers. Well, this year, we decided that we were going to give the, uh, the um, or was it mothers or was it teachers, Renee? You'll have to remind me. I don't remember which one. But we got them rather than, you know, some of you are probably planting right now, and maybe you're deciding between putting annuals and perennials in, right? Well, we gave these volunteers these flowers, but they were made of like a, a velvet, and they were kind of fancy fake flowers. So I made the joke that rather than being annuals or perennials, because these will never go away, they're eternials, all right? And the idea was that they are bearing fruit in these kids' lives that's going to last forever, okay? Yeah, so you guys get the pun, right? So these were our, our eternial flowers, uh, and they were for, <laughs> fake flowers. They were probably made of non-biodegradable material, so they might literally be eternial, so we'll, but we'll see, I guess. Um, and so this idea of that long-lasting. Now, um, just one more illustration when we start thinking about these temporary versus eternal is the idea, it may sound funny, but this idea of how many of you heard of the forever stamp? How many of you have heard of the forever stamp? It's a concept when you're mailing. By the way, kids, this is when you write a letter and you mail it. It has nothing to do with email, okay? But when you actually write a letter and you mail it, you have to pay for that, okay? And there's something called inflation. We've all heard of that before. And the pricing of stamps has gone up over the years. But there's this option back in, I believe it was 2007, they started what was called the forever stamp. And the forever stamp was a, a stamp that no matter how long you held it, what used to happen was you would hold a stamp and then the price would change and you'd have to buy penny stamps to make up for your old stamp, okay? But what the post office did was they got forever stamps. And they would be basically stamps that would always be the right price for a normal letter. And if you bought that, it will forever work as a, just a letter, a single letter, a uh, normal size weighted wet letter it will send. But the interesting thing is, it's the exact same price as a normal stamp uh, when you go to just buy stamps. So my question is, why would anybody ever not buy an, like a, a forever stamp, right? Like anybody with me on that one? Like why would you go buy a, just like a normal price stamp? It just doesn't make it. But that's kind of what we do sometimes is we go and we've got the forever stamp available for us and we go and choose a stamp that's gonna go away, a, a, a prize, a treasure that's going to fade away. It's going to rot away or somebody can come along and steal it. See, in verse 21, one of the key verses, and this is one that we wanna remember, it says, for, there, or for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Remember we talked about the treasure was that most important thing, the thing that we would sell everything for, the put, thing we put in the premier spot. When we talk about heart here, the expression in the Bible, the heart, and it's similar to how we use it now. It's not, obviously not talking about the organ that pumps the blood throughout your body. It's talking about the most central part of yourself, the, almost the idea of the deepest part of yourself, the most inward part, like the real me down to the bone. It's this idea of like giving your whole heart to something. And what we treasure is often that's what we will give our heart to. We root our entire happiness and our contentment is oftentimes rooted in this. If we have our treasure, we're content. If we lack it, we aren't. And the challenge is if it's a temporary treasure, oftentimes even if we have it, the fear of loss can cause us to be discontent. See, where our treasure is, what we put in the most value, that's where our heart is going to be. See, we started off this morning by Rene reading the rich and foolish ruler. Now, in that context, Jesus, it's actually at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, so we're going to preach this a little bit further. But Jesus says, all these things that I'm talking about, this entire sermon, if you heard this, and if you do anything about it, it's like you're the wise builder. But if you don't do anything about it, you just hear it and don't let it change how, how you are and who you are, 
you are like a foolish builder. And the difference is, is where they would build their house. And when we set our treasure on something eternal and, and in heaven, it's like we're on the solid rock. That there's, we're on ground that is unchanging. And notice how in that verse it says, when the rain comes, not if the rain comes. Because in life, rain comes. And stuff happens. And no matter what, no matter who you are, no one is immune from the rain coming. And if we're on the solid rock, the house remains. And yet the foolish builder, the one who hears what God says and doesn't do it, or in this case, the one who stores up riches on this earth and puts their treasure on this earth rather than in heaven, has his foundation on the sand, where nothing is solid. It's not very long-lasting. And ever try to build a sand castle on the beach? You ever try to uh, uh, deal with just uh, trying to set anything on the beach, even as you sink in when you put your chair there? There's nothing that holds you up. And then when the, when the rain comes, the fall is great. So when we look at these verses, we want to make sure that we understand Jesus is telling to set our foundation, put our hearts, place our hearts in heavenly things, in eternal things, and not be attached to the things of the world. Jesus takes a little shift here, but ultimately it's on the same theme. He begins to talk about the eye in verse 22. He says, the eye is the lamp for the body. So if the eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body is full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? So first of all, this expression of the eye. We don't necessarily view the eye as, as, as deeply, maybe, as what the culture of Jesus' time would have been. During this time, the eye was like kind of the window to you, the window to your body, the window to your health. If you had bad eyesight, that was a, an idea that there was something wrong, that there was an illness, there was something that was happening. Uh, if there was a, a, a problem with your eyes, people would have assumed that there was something going wrong. It's like the light and the lamp to the inner part of you. And really what they would do is they would assume the quality of the person based on the eyes. This idea of light and darkness obviously has a good and evil um, kind of, th that's an illustration used in the, in the Bible often, that, that light is good and darkness is, is evil. And this idea is that clear vision, clear understanding, clear eyes Light-filled eyes would, would be equated with loyalty to God, and bad eyes would be this idea of being blinded, being, your vision being corrupted, and moral corruption coming into your life. So the eye that is good brings in light and is good, but the eye that is darkened, that is, that is blinded, that is morally corrupt, that is the eye that falls short. Now it's important for us to remember and understand that we all fall short, right? Right? We all fall short of the glory of God. The scriptures tell us that. We know that we are all made in God's image. It's this weird tension that we have as believers. Um, and everybody in the world is made in the image of God. We're all image bearers. So we have the capacity for great good. In fact, a lot of the good that you see in this world has to do with the idea that we were made in God's image. And when God made us, it said that we were not only good, but very good. But... All of us have also been corrupted by sin, which brings darkness into us. So though it's true that we are image bearers of God and we still have that good potential, there's also a blackness that happens in our hearts that we're all sinners that fall short of the glory of God. And it's just because of God's grace, God gives us the grace that we're not nearly as bad as we potentially could be. But that's why we need the gospel. See, the gospel doesn't necessarily make us better, it just makes us forgiven. Okay, but we have that tension of being uh, not only with that image-bearing good potential, but the corruption of sin. And it's with the rebirth of our salvation and with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that we continue to do good, that we can be those who have clear vision and light is in us. Though there is darkness, God continues to work to remove that darkness, and in heaven, that will be removed. So we need to understand that there is the potential for good, goodness in us. And when our eyes are clear and we're seeing clearly, the light is in us. And when our eyes are set on heaven, there is light in us. But when we are focused on this world, when we are focused on ourselves, that is when darkness comes in. 
And it is our jobs as, as, as believers, as we talked about with this sermon, is that this sermon is both this unbelievable standard that none of us can fulfill. It's such a high standard, particularly when we talked about a few weeks ago, when we talked about hating somebody as murder or looking at somebody in lust as the same as adultery. None of us can live up to that. But we also talked about that there is times that we can, through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, at times live up to that standard. And that's what we should seek to do. That's what we should seek to do. And it, we finish here by talking about, uh, in verse 24, it says, no one can serve two masters, for either he hates one and loves the other, or he will devote himself to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So we see here, money as a master is, is kind of this interesting thing. You know, we don't shy away from talking about money here at Emmaus. Sometimes people struggle with that, struggle with the idea, why is it important for us to talk about it? Well, because the Bible talks about it more than 2,000 times, uh, um, talks about um, possessions, talks about giving, talks about money. That's twice as many verses about money than there is about faith or prayer. See, money, the challenge is, it's a very easy treasure for us to seek after. And oftentimes it can capture our hearts. And so that is why Jesus is identifying that in this section. Now it's important for us to understand though, there's a misquote that many people do when they say money is the root of all evil. Money is, maybe you've heard that before, money is the root of all evil. That's actually a misquote from a Bible verse. 1 Timothy um, 6.1, I'm sorry, 6.10 actually says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, is, is what 2 Timothy, or 1 Timothy says. And so it's actually the love of money. Money itself doesn't necessarily have moral agency, Money itself isn't necessarily good or bad. It's amoral. It can be both good or bad. It just depends on who has it. Money is more of a tool. So in a good person's hand, a hammer can build a, a, a house. It can build housing. It can build bridges. It can build, but in an evil person's hand, a hammer can kill. So similar to a hammer, money is like a tool. Good person, a person who is, Good intentions can do good with it, but a person with bad intentions can do very bad with it. So the important thing for us to understand is we need to know that money makes a very good tool, but it makes a horrible master. Money makes a horrible master. Jesus is warning us here as we're talking about putting our treasure in heaven that one of the major things that we will have to watch out for is that we would not allow money to become our treasure. Leo Tolstoy, uh, one of the most famous Russian uh, authors, he wrote a story once about a successful peasant farmer who was not satisfied with the amount of land that he had. He wanted more, and he wanted it now. One day he received a, a kind of an interesting offer. He said for a thousand rubles, which I have no idea if that's a lot or not, um, but we'll just say it's a good deal. Uh, he could buy as much land as he could walk around in one day, Okay. The only catch was the deal that he had to be back at the starting point by sundown. So early the next morning, he got up, started walking at a fast pace, and by midday, he was very tired. But he kept going, covering more and more ground. Well, in the afternoon, he realized that his greed had actually taken him far from the starting point. He quickened his pace as the sun began to sink lower in the sky, he began to run, knowing that if he didn't make it back before sundown, the opportunity to become even bigger landowner was gonna be lost. As the sun began to sink below the horizon, he came within sight of the finish line. He gasped for air, his heart was pounding. He called uh, upon every bit of strength that he had in his body, and he staggered across the line just as the sun appeared. But, he immediately collapsed. Uh, blood started to come out of his mouth. A few minutes later, he died. Afterward, his servant dug a grave. And it was not more than six feet long and three feet wide. The title of Tolstoy's story was, How Much Land Does a Man Need? And so we see that, that oftentimes greed and, and treasuring things of this world can be a trap for us. We can go after a trap of temporary fulfillment of temporary uh, possessions. And what Jesus is telling us to do, that there is something more. We should invest in things that are eternal. See, what we need to understand that treasuring heaven 
can actually also equal contentment in this life. It's not just all delayed gratification, although we as humans struggle with delayed gratification, right? It's about now, it's about instant, particularly with, you know, Netflix, like, you don't, these kids don't know what it's like to have to wait for a week for the episode to come out. And if you weren't there, you didn't, and you missed it, and you didn't record it on the VCR, we'll tell you what a VCR is later, you didn't see it, right? You had to wait till it went to syndication and went to reruns, okay? Like, Instant gratification, right? So there, there's one sense that, that delayed gratification is a good thing, but there's also a sense that this treasuring in heaven also helps us with this life now. So actually later on, we're, we're going to get to this in a couple weeks, uh, in Matthew 6.33 it says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. What Jesus is telling us here is that that when we seek after the kingdom of God, when we make that our highest priority, when we care more about people because that's what God cares about, when we care about people because people are eternal even though stuff is not, when we care about glorifying God and worshiping God and we put those things first, Jesus is literally saying here that these other things will be added to you. Other things will be added to you if you seek the kingdom. Let's see how that works here. I would argue, and it's counterintuitive, that if we were to seek after eternal things and we were to ignore the things of this world for the things of this world to come to us, but here's how it works. I believe following after this actually makes our lives better. See, if we treasure the world, if we treasure worldly things, oftentimes it comes with heartache. Number one, because it falls short. It cannot fulfill. It cannot fulfill because oftentimes what we're missing in our hearts is a God-sized hole, a God-shaped hole. And there's only one thing that can fill that, and that's God. A God-sized hole can't be filled with possessions. An eternally large need for God cannot be fulfilled with temporary things. Uh, C.S. Lewis actually said that this, this longing, that this need is actually an evidence of God. It says if, if we find ourselves in a desire um, that nothing of this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. And so, first of all, when we seek after this world first, it can never fulfill. And oftentimes when we do, even when we have it, we can fear the loss of it. Anybody ever had that? I, I, I had this. I, there, was, there was a time where I was struggling with some depression. I was struggling with some anxiety. And you know what the hardest part about it was? Is actually life was pretty good. Anybody ever had a season where life was going pretty good and, and maybe on the surface if people would look at you from the outside, you've got it all together, you've got everything you would have wanted, but still there's something like just missing there? Like, like you don't know why and you should be happy, but you just can't be 100% happy with it? Well, sometimes it's because we fear losing that. I know during that season it was like, what if something happens to disrupt all this blessings that God has had for us? And there's this idea that there's a scarcity mentality sometimes that we have that, that there's never enough and we always need to protect and hold. But what happens is, when we have an eternal perspective, it builds gratitude into our lives. And it builds gratitude for what we have because when we put it as kind of extra, when we say, okay, if we have Christ, if we have heaven, then that's all that we need. Anything else is like extra. Anything else is like an extra bonus. Oftentimes we can enjoy it more when our heart is in heaven, when our heart is set on eternity. See, it's easier to enjoy the things that we have when we do it with open hands and we don't squeeze it and hold on to it and grip it. When we seek first the kingdom of God, the other things in our life can align properly. The relationships that we have can be more healthy. If we, if we put all that we have on this marriage relationship, this friendship, this any other kind of relationship that we have, that relationship can't hold that. But if our heart is set in heaven, that relationship can thrive because it's in its proper place. See, another misquoted verse, we talked about money is the root of all evil, right? But another one of the most it's not so much a misquoted verse, but it's actually just a, a verse out of context is, anybody have a mug or anything that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? Anybody got one? You don't have to raise your hand. It's okay. I know you do. 
I know you posted it too. You got a t-shirt or a hat or something, right? Well, it's interesting. Oftentimes when we see that, the, 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 the people are talking about like scoring a touchdown or having business success or I can go take this world. I can be the most important and I can be uh, really successful. But unfortunately, the context is nothing like that. Uh, Paul is actually talking about in, uh, when he's talking about that, that's from uh, Philippians 4, 11 through 13. He says, not that I am speaking from need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every situation, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hungry, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So the, the actual context of that is contentment, even in suffering, even in difficulty. Let's, let's take a quick look at Paul's life in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 through 28. He had a heavenly perspective. His heart was in heaven. His treasure was Jesus. It, sa it says, in 11, uh, 23 through 28, just a description of his life, he says, are, are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman. Uh, am I, I, am, I am talking like a madman. Uh, far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, other, uh, often near death, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews, 40 lashes uh, less one. Three times I was beaten with a rod. Once I was stoned. Three times I was ship shipwrecked. Uh, and a night and a day uh, I was adrift at sea. With frequent journeys in danger and river, danger of robbers, danger uh, um, from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger of, from the false brothers, and toil and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and in thirst, often without food, in cold and in exposure, and apart from other things, there was the daily pressures of anxiety for all the churches. That's a real pastor statement right there, anxiety for the churches. <laughs> And that's what we're talking about when Paul is saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's that contentment. He's been through all that. And it says in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 10, it says, For Christ's sake, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardship, persecution, calamity. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul here is not placing his contentment on the world. He's not placing the contentment on his circumstances, but he's placing it in heaven. See, Paul is also saying in Philippians 1.21, he says, for to live is Christ and to die is gain. His most prized treasure was Christ. His, most, his heart was placed in heaven and not on this earth. How can we go through things like that and um, live in a way that still honors God. How can we go through trials and tribulations? Well, it's because our treasure isn't set in our circumstances. It's because our treasure is set in heaven. It's because our hearts belong to heaven. It's because Jesus is our greatest treasure. And so if we have our greatest treasure, we'd be willing to sell everything else. We'd be willing to get rid of everything else if we just had that treasure. And all we need to do is believe. It comes through faith. Not through our good works, not through being perfect, but through trusting in Jesus' perfect life and his death and resurrection that we can be his children. So let's be a church whose heart is set in heaven. Our heart should be set in heaven. Our treasure, our highest treasure, should be Jesus. And if that's the case, regardless of what happens in this world, regardless of what happens, we can say it is well with our soul. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the scriptures. We thank you for, we thank you, uh, for the truth that Jesus is telling us here and, and just the example that he was, Lord, of this upside-down kingdom. Lord, that he showed us that this world is temporary, that it all will go away, that it, it doesn't fulfill us, and yet he pointed towards a fulfillment that comes from knowing you and, and placing our, our faith and our trust and our peace in eternity. Lord, help us to figuratively sell all of this world to go after Jesus.
Now, Lord, that doesn't mean that we're out of this world. It doesn't mean that we uh, don't still live in this world, Lord. We are meant to be in this world, but not of this world. But Lord, our trust and our hope and our treasure is in you. Our hearts belong to heaven. We are citizens, not of this world, but the citizens of heaven. And help us to do that so, Lord, that we can, regardless of what happens in our life, what, regardless of what's going on in the world, we can say it is well with our souls. We thank you for that, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Get, 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 get.